Our next presenter is David Penn, uh, founder of Hit Songs Deconstructed. Uh, Dave is going to be sharing his hit songwriting tips, techniques, and trends culled from the songs currently topping the charts. Thank you all so much for coming out here tonight, especially when it's so frigid outside. Really appreciate it. It's great to see all of you. You're all familiar with Diane Warren, hit songwriter extraordinaire. That's what Diane Warren has to say. You should listen to songs and listen to what works. Listen to why the song is a hit. Check it out, not to imitate it, but there are certain things that work, hooks and melodies, hear what works throughout the ages. That is essentially the core premise behind Hit Songs Deconstructed. We're a site and publication dedicated to providing songwriters, producers, and the music industry with the craft and trends that drive today's chart-topping hits for success in today's music industry. Now, one question I get from time to time is why focus on current hits? Why not focus on Lennon, McCartney, Brill Building composers, um, Motown, the 60s and 70s? And it's very simple. It's just as important to be current and relevant to what's going on today as it is to understand the craft that has defined hit songs throughout the ages. What we do is we break today's hit songs down to their core, extract the craft that made them a hit, and provide you with the knowledge and best practices to help prime you for success in a very competitive, fast-changing musical landscape. But most importantly, while remaining true to your own unique artistic vision. That's what it's all about. It's not about being a clone or adhering to one specific formula. Basically, you bring the originality and the inspiration to the table, we show you how to craft it in the most infectious, engaging, and memorable manner possible so that you connect with the widest possible audience. So on that note, this is what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to provide you with techniques for engaging the listener and keeping them engaged throughout the song. I'm going to show you examples of clever elements and wow factors that help to put songs over the top how to stand out from the pack and push the boundaries of what's been done before by fusing multiple subgenres into new and exciting compositions. And finally, I'm going to give you the secret ingredient that could be found in many of today's most successful chart-topping uh, pop, hip-hop, rap, country, and rock songs. You all already know what it is, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But to begin, you have to engage the listener. As you can see, there's a fruit fly on the screen. Why is there a fruit fly? Let's be honest. Today, more so than ever, people have the attention span of a fruit fly. They're texting, they're tweeting, they're doing a million different things except paying attention to what's going on around them. That's why it's of utmost importance to instantly engage the listener, hook them in with the song, and get on with the rest of it ASAP. So how do we do this? There are three methods for beginning your song. Number one, you can immediately start with a verse. This is effective because it instantly gets the listener into the meat of the song, so to speak. But the thing that you need to know, it's a rarity, all right? So out of the 92 or so songs that landed in the Billboard Pop Songs Top 10 during 2013, only five songs immediately kicked off with a verse as opposed to a chorus or an intro. There were Daylight, Demons, Holy Grail, Royals, and Stay the Night. But as you can see, it certainly didn't hamper their chances of success. Next most popular, you can immediately kick off with the chorus. This is effective because it immediately hits the listener with the most infectious, engaging, and memorable part of your song. If your chorus is not the most infectious, engaging, and memorable part of the song, a rewrite is probably in order. Two examples of how to do this, you have Cruz, Florida Georgia Line. This is where the uh, chorus immediately kicks off the song. There's no intro. Another method to do this, come and get it, Selena Gomez. You have an intro, then your chorus, and then it follows with a verse. And that was um, about one-fifth of those 92 songs picked off with a verse as a chorus as opposed to the verse. Finally, the most popular method that you could use to start off your song, obviously, is to utilize an intro. This was indicative of 84% 80, of all those songs. The primary characteristic that they all had in common, that most had in common anyway, is that they were short. 87% landed at 19 seconds or less during the last quarter of the year. 56% landed at just 9 seconds or less. So it goes to show you there's a reason why intros are short. Hook the listener in, 
get on with it ASAP. The more you linger, the more you stand the chance of losing their attention. But that's not to say that you can't have a longer length intro. 12% landed at over 20 seconds, 6% landed at over 30 seconds. So there is a way to make it effective. We're going to get to that in just a little bit. Types of intros. There are many. So we're going to focus on five of the key ones here tonight that are the most popular and most effective. Number one, utilizing the backing music of the section that directly follows, be it the verse or the chorus. This is effective because it instantly establishes the vibe of the song and it provides for a seamless transition between sections. So here we're going to take a listen to Wrecking Ball as an example. So here it's establishing the melancholy vibe of the song. And the vocal on top. That's it. Very simple, very effective, very popular. The next one, artist plugs, this is like building free marketing into your song. So for example, if you're listening to the radio and you don't know who the artist is and you don't know who's being featured on the track, this type of intro solves that problem for you. And you know who the uh, pro with this is? Pitbull. The second you hear Pitbull's song, all right, you know it's Mr. Worldwide and you know who's being featured on the track because he's telling you. So in this case, we're going to listen to Dark Horse, Katy Perry, and Juicy J is going to do the intro. Will. Free marketing built into your song. Very effective. Next, we have a very effective intro called the multi hook. This is like a one two punch at the beginning of your song. So, in this case, we're going to check out um, Cruise by Florida Georgia Line. It's going to start off with an abbreviated chorus, okay? Two lines. Um, it's going to establish the vocal hook and the vocal melody hook as well. It's going to be followed by an instrumental hook. So by the time you get to the verse, you've totally got the listener enveloped in the song. Check this out. Hook one. Hook two. Just so you know, this hook also occurs as the turnaround after the second chorus, and then repeats in the outro as well to get it fully ingrained within the listener's head. So very effective, before you get to that verse, you have this multi-hook which doubles the engagement factor for the listener. Next, we have narration. Very simple. It's an original line that grabs the listener's attention. This happens to be one of my favorite intros of the entire year. This is Treasured by Bruno Mars. If you're adverse, to uh, profanity, go like this though. Give me, give me, give me your attention, baby. How do you get your attention? By starting your song by saying, baby squirrel, use a sexy motherfucker. <laughs> Grabs my attention. I don't know what it means, but it totally hooks you into the song and functions as a unique identifier. There's nothing else to my knowledge that sounds like that. Finally, we have the multifaceted intro. This is where we have diverse elements entering the mix throughout in order to keep the listener engaged. In the case of Thrift Shop, it's 33 seconds long, the intro. Very long by mainstream standards. So what we're going to have here is broken down essentially into four different segments with a new element entering the mix during each segment. So check this out and watch how it keeps the listener engaged throughout. Segment one. Acts as a unique identifier for the song as well. Here's segment two. What, what vocal and the drums? Ten seconds later. Another vocal element enters the mix. Keeps the listener engaged. Everything's firing at the same time. To finish the listener off, primary hook comes into the mix. Everything's firing all cylinders now. You get everything happening at the same time. But just to make sure the listener's completely engaged, this happens. They do not go into the verse, they go into the chorus. So by the time you get to that verse, you've completely hooked the listener in. And we all know what happened with Thrift Shop, performed marginally well throughout the world. All right, intro takeaways. Your intro should instantly grab and hold the listener's attention. It should instantly establish the mood and the vibe of the song. 
If you're using an intro, keep it short. 10 to 15 seconds is a good, good rule of thumb. Uh, the average for last year, I think, was around 13 seconds. If it's longer, like we saw at Thrift Shop, make sure you have new elements entering the mix that keeps, us, keeps the listener engaged throughout. And it should also act as a unique identifier for your song. Baby squirrel, so on and so forth. Okay. Now that we've engaged the listener, now the real work begins. Now we have to keep them engaged throughout the entire song. The fruit fly factor is still in full effect here. They're texting, they're tweeting, they're doing a million different things looking to be distracted at any point. Which is why every single section of your song must be optimized to keep the listener engaged throughout. How do we do this? There are many methods. We're going to focus on a few here tonight. Just want to read you this list though. Balancing repetition and diversity throughout the song. Providing a dynamic listening experience. Setting up the payoff from maximum impact. Clever, engaging lyrics. Imagery, action, detail, emotion, saying it like it's never been said before, communicating it in a universal manner so it connects with the widest possible audience. Rhyming schemes, infectious memorable melodies, and of course the KISS principle, keep it simple and singable, keep it simple stupid, however you keep it, keep it simple, don't overcomplicate. All right, balancing repetition and diversity, number one. The fruit fly will be kept engaged with diversity entering the mix throughout the entire song. New elements keeps them engaged. The brainwashing that you see there stems from repetition, getting that infectious melody and all the infectious elements of the song completely ingrained within the listener's head, brainwashing them, so to speak. All right, repetition fosters memorability. Within your song, you'll have lyrical, musical, and vocal melody repetition throughout. Diversity, contrast, heightens the engagement factor. Very important now, you need the perfect balance between the two to, to achieve the most infectious, engaging, and memorable listening experience. So think of it this way, if you have too much diversity with not enough repetition, you have too many elements happening that are never gonna remember anything. If you have too much repetition without diversity, your songs can become overly monotonous, you're gonna bore the listener and they're gonna tune out. You need the perfect balance between the two. Here's our case study, Wrecking Ball. What we're gonna do, we're not seeing the video, I apologize if I disappointed anybody. Um, we're gonna compare like sections within the song. So in this case, we're gonna compare pre-chorus one, pre-chorus two, and pre-chorus three. We're gonna see the similarities of the repetition between sections that gets it ingrained within your head. And then we're gonna see the difference, the new elements entering throughout that keeps the listener engaged throughout the entire song. So, we're going to listen to all three, but keep these in mind while we listen. The vocal melody will remain constant in all three pre-choruses. The chorus synth will remain constant in pre-choruses one and two. The lyrics will remain the same in all three pre-chorus occurrences. And this is pretty much indicative of a pre-chorus. The differences, which heightens engagement, pre-chorus two will add strings, additional synths, electric guitar, bass, and vocal harmony elements that were not in the first verse, uh, first pre-chorus, excuse me. Pre-chorus three is a complete departure in the sense that it's half the length, and it's also a breakdown pre-chorus. It's very sparse in nature. It's gonna feature low-level piano and vocal. So check this out, and I'll talk you through it as we go through. Here's number one. Here's number two. Now notice what's happening with the backing music. It's been changed up. We have new elements entering the mix. It keeps it colorful, infectious, and engaging. It's your vocal harmony. But notice that the lyrics and the vocal melody remain constant, getting that ingrained within your head. So you have the perfect balance between the two. Finally, here's pre-chorus three. Don't you ever say, I just walked away, I will always want you. Sparse in nature, but we still had the same vocal melody and we had the same lyrics. That's an extremely important pre-chorus, you can see why in just a little bit. Another important way to keep the listener engaged is to provide MTI level 
or dynamic shifts throughout the song. MTI is a term that I came up with to describe momentum, tension, and intensity factors throughout the song. So an infectious, engaging, and memorable melody is not enough. You need to take the listener on a dynamic journey throughout the entire song. It's brought about via shifts in overall levels, the nature of the backing music, vocal delivery, or all three. And if nowhere else within the song, if you're flatlining dynamically throughout your song, make sure, especially in the, in the bridge or around the bridge, that you have the most profound dynamic shift occurring there. Not only does the bridge give you a lyrical departure and a musical departure, but it's also giving you a dynamic departure as well. So here's an MTI level roadmap that I came up with for Wrecking Ball. It's a song that's indicative of a very powerful chorus. It's a power ballad. So let me just walk you through this real fast here. In the intro, it's going to start out with a moderate level intensity. It's going to increase in the verse, further increase in the pre-chorus, and then it's going to peak in the chorus, in the payoff. Then to give the listener a respite from all that intention, you know, tension and intensity that they've been building, we have a downshift. All right? We bring it back down, and then we repeat it again. We have another build in the verse, the pre-chorus, and then we finally peak once again in the second chorus. Then we get to this highlighted area here. This is the area that surrounds the bridge. This is where we're going to pick it up at the end of that chorus. I'll walk you through what's going on as we listen. So here's your powerful chorus. Now watch what happens. Everything is brought way down. Drums and electric guitar from the chorus pulled from the mix. So all we have, strings, piano, bass, and vocal. Also very important, notice how the backing music and the vocal is totally accentuating the nature of the lyrics. Alright, now watch what happens. It goes all the way down. There's your breakdown pre-chorus. Now watch how it sets up the powerful chorus now, check this out. That is how you set a powerful chorus up from maximum perceived impact. And that brings us into payoff impact accentuators. Just having a really infectious payoff for the listener is not enough. How you set it up makes all the difference. So three of the most effective methods to do this amongst many include the vocal lead-in that sets up a big powerful chorus, and that's what we just saw at Wrecking Ball. The Tension Intensity Builder, this is indicative of pop songs that contain an EDM-natured nat instrumental break within the mix. Then we also have something called the Fake Out, which is a breakdown full chorus combo. We'll be taking a look at each now. So here's one more example of the vocal lead-in. So in this case, we're going to check out Katy Perry's Unconditionally. We're going to pick it up in like this breakdown-natured verse. We're going to see towards the end of it right over here, you're going to have a swell towards the end can be followed by complete silence, which you know, heightens all this tension and anticipation going into the chorus. We're going to have a vocal lead-in, a solo vocal lead-in, and then we're going to have the full chorus explode from maximum impact on the title there. So check this out. So here we are on the verse. Here comes the swell. Almost like faking out the listener a little bit. Totally accentuates the impact of that chorus. As opposed to like if you just had all the backing music going and you just led into the chorus, it wouldn't have the same impact. Very powerful. Alright, next we have the tension intensity builder. This is, and we're going to look at uh, clarity here. What's really cool about this one is that it actually contains three payoffs for the listener. The chorus, the instrumental break, and then what's really cool about this is you're going to see the chorus and the instrumental break fuse into one entity at the end of the section to take the excitement level for the listener to a grand peak. So we're going to pick it up in the chorus. Now, what you should notice is the chorus is not providing any tension relief from what was building up in the verse and the pre-chorus. It's going to continue to build throughout the entire section, and the relief, or the tension release, is then going to happen in the instrumental break. So check this out. 
Here's the chorus. Watch what happens with the drums and the nature of the vocal. Drums becoming more prominent to the mix, speeding up. It's going to reach an apex. Tension peak. And there's your release into the instrumental break. Now notice what happens with the drums coming up and also with the nature of the set. We're going to have some diversity entering the mix to keep the listener engaged throughout. Drums become changed up. A little synth changes over there. One more peak coming up here. Ready? Payoff number three. They merged into one entity. Have one more peak at the tail end, bring the excitement to an apex. Abrupt cutoff, false ending to the section, then leads into the second verse. That's your tension and intensity builder. Finally, we have the fake out, the breakdown full chorus combo. Here we're going to listen to an oldie but a goodie by mainstream standards, Britney Spears' I Want to Go. Here we are on the pre-chorus. Now watch how this leads into this huge chorus that follows. Right? Oh no. There's a breakdown. So it kind of fakes out the listener a little bit. You're expecting a big chorus, but it breaks it down. The kick enters the mix. Get some momentum going. Synth swell, solo vocal, explode into the final chorus. So when you're in that pre-chorus, you know, when you think of a Britney Spears song or something, you think that it's just going to explode automatically into this huge chorus, but it doesn't happen. They break it down. This is uh, Stargate, by the way, who wrote this. They break it all the way down. They build it back up. And then you have that solo vocal lead-in, like we saw with Unconditionally and Wrecking Ball, that leads into that powerful chorus to conclude the section. Standing out from the pack, extremely important. Just having an infectious, engaging, and memorable song with strong dynamic shifts is not enough. You need to incorporate clever elements and wow factors into the mix in order to help put it over the top. Also, fusing multiple subgenres in a creative manner will push the boundaries of what's been done before. All right, we're going to take a look now at some clever elements and wow factors. We're going to go back to Wrecking Ball. We're going to check out the chorus. Two things to keep in mind here. Listen to the wrecking ball elements within the section. The nature of the snare and the kick sounds like a wrecking ball slamming into the side of the building, which accentuates the nature of the title lyric and also the lyrics within the section. Pay attention while we do that. Also, clever vocal phrasing. The way she sings, you wreck me and you break me, it's different, it's engaging, it's memorable. It puts the section and the song over the top. Check this out. So you hear what's going on with the kick and the snare. It sounds like a wrecking ball slamming into the side of the building. Now listen to how she sings the lyrics here. And repeat. Clever vocal phrasing puts it over the top. As opposed to if she just said, you break me and you wreck me. Who cares? Roar. Clever vocal phrasing. Listen to this one. The way, so she's going to sandwich this clever phrasing in between two roar lyrics. Check this out. And you're gonna hear me roar. It puts the section and the song completely over the top. Get creative with this kind of stuff. Radioactive, two key things to pay attention here. Obviously, radioactive means radioactive. Watch what's happening with the nature of the synth, specifically the dubstep nature. It sounds like it's radioactive. Then we have a magic moment, the gasp. So when he sings the lyrics, I'm breathing in the chemicals, not only do you hear him sing, 
I'm breathing in the chemicals. But then you actually hear him breathing in the chemicals. It's a magic moment that puts the section and the song over the top. Check this out. I'm waking up. There's your radioactive natured sim. Very clever. I sweat my rust. Here it comes. I'm breathing in the chemicals. <laughs> totally clever. So obviously you're not going to use these specific elements within your song, but think outside the box. Think what can you do to your song to make it stand out from everybody else. You don't want to blend in, you want to stand out. Fusion. All right, I'm just going to show you this real fast here. During 2013, the vast majority of songs that landed in the Billboard Pop Songs Top 10 were pop fusion songs, fusing multiple subgenres together within a single song. Examples include Cruise, the Nelly remix, fuses country, pop rock, and hip hop rap. Get Lucky fuses retro funk, disco, and R&B soul. Safe and Sound, electro alt pop, dance, and 80s new wave, very hot right now. Slow Down, straight up pop, dance, EDM, funk, and dubstep, all within the same song. And of course, Wake Me Up, country folk, fusing with EDM. Now that's the perfect example of taking a risk and having it pay off big time. Because the man could have alienated his entire EDM audience, but instead it launched him as a global hit phenomenon. Two methods for you to do this. Number one, we have the blend. This is where you have multiple subgenres firing at the same time within your song, okay? In the case of Get Lucky and Treasure, we have funk, disco, and R&B all happening at the same time. Pitbull songs, he's rapping over a dance track. Two subgenres, both happening at the same time. Radioactive, rock, pop, dubstep, all at the same time. But you could also break it up by section as well. So in the case of Cruise, the Nelly remix, we have a country and uh, we have a country natured verse and chorus, but we have a rap bridge. Two different sections, two different subgenres. Wake me up, country folk verse, EDM natured instrumental break. Again, two different sections, two subgenres. Remember, you're not reinventing the wheel with your compositions. You're pushing the envelope of what has been done before, otherwise known as music evolution. And a key way to do this is by fusing different subgenres into new, unique, trend-setting compositions. And this is really where originality and uh, creativity come into play. Now, the secret ingredients that I was telling you about before that is utilized in mainstream pop, rock, country, and hip-hop rap songs, you all know what it is. Ready? Nas, woes, woos, and sometimes haze. <laughs> they all have it, every single one. Let's take a quick look at some of, the sub, uh, some of the genres and you can see how it's utilized. So here's pop, come and get it. Here's your Nas. Here's rock, radioactive, your woe. Even in mainstream country, here's another differentiated woe. Catch yourself a little catfish dinner. Don't it sound like a winner when I lay you down and love you right? Yeah, that's my kind of night. Yeah, that's my kind of night. It's more of like an 80s Bon Jovi woe. That's, that's country night. today. It ain't Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash, I'll tell you that much. All right, hip hop, rap, pop, RB, rock, fusion, the monster. Here's your. What oh you think I'm crazy, yeah, you think I'm crazy. Well that's not fair. They all got it. Well that's not fair. And finally, the number one song everywhere right now, country, hip hop rap, dance fusion, timber, here's your woo. I'll remember I'll be the one you won't forget. All got this stuff. Interesting fact about this one. 28% of this entire song consists solely of woos. Number one all over the world. So it just goes to show you. So two things to keep in mind with your woos and your nas and your woes and your haze. They usually occur within the chorus or right after. 
and they are a vital ingredient within mainstream songs. If you're composing for the mainstream, throw them in, it will only help. All right, some additional tips before I get out of here tonight. Balance the familiar with the original. Very important. If you're coming too far out of left field and you're too unique and too different and everything, it's gonna be very hard for people to instantly engage in your song. So you need to balance what's been done before. Not ripping anybody off, but I'm talking about craft. What's been done before, so like you instantly engage them with your original unique nature. When you blend the two together, that's the recipe for success. Remix your songs to maximize exposure. Cruise is a perfect example of this. A mainstream country song, you throw Nelly onto it, you throw a lot of synths into it, and all of a sudden it's on the Hot 100. Maximize your exposure, very important. Observe your target audience, this one's great. Go to a party, go to a club, go anywhere, and watch how people interact with music, all right? See when they're singing along, when they're dancing along, what they're really paying attention to, or when they're not paying attention at all. You can learn a lot about songwriting and a lot about how to connect with your audience by doing this. Sandwich your songs. This is how you can critique yourself. So like, for example, if you're doing like a Britney Spears, electro pop kind of song, whatever, Sandwich it between a Katie song and a Britney song. Listen to all three back to back, all right? If you stick out like a sore thumb and not in a good way, you know that it rewrites them probably in order. But the really cool thing about this exercise is that you're gonna be able to pinpoint what part of your song needs work. Is your chorus not hitting hard enough? Is your intro too long? Do you have not enough contrast throughout the song? It's a great way to do it. And when you fix your song and you sandwich it back in and you could listen through continuity and it all fits, then you know that your song is optimized for maximum potential, go and pitch it. Finally, it all starts and ends with a song. Marketing, PR, you know, Kickstarter campaigns, networking skills, it's all exceptionally important, don't get me wrong. But when you get through the door, you make that contact, you, you, know, you network with people, you gotta make sure that your song is primed for maximum impact and success. And that's where Hit Songs Deconstructed comes into play. Our reports are geared to get you thinking and writing with a hit song mentality. So when inspiration hits, you have the tools to craft, craft that inspiration in the most infectious, engaging, and memorable manner possible so that it connects with the widest possible audience, but most importantly, like I said earlier, while adhering to your own unique artistic identity. It's been a pleasure talking to you all tonight. Thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you to SAE, Music Producers Forum, Imagine 360 Marketing for helping put this together. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much.